I'm Ulysses Baltazar. I'm a vascular surgeon with the Houston Methodist um, group, and uh, I do 100% veins for personal reasons. In 2008, Mike Reardon, have you, have you seen Mike Reardon? Is he here giving talks today or not? Mike Reardon uh, had the pleasure to crack my chest and uh, put a new aortic valve, and that changed my perception of life, and that's what I went into veins. Um, for most of the uh, of, of uh, uh, the decision was made because of my family, but anyway, that's why I'm doing base 100%. Uh, so let's go. Let's get what we're going to talk about is is not a you know complete course about venous insufficiency. The venous insufficiency is just a brief brush, so you know what you're talking about when you go to your with oh, this monitor is off. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> when, you, when you go to your training places, at least you have an idea. And most of the stuff is going to be repetitive, so we are going to go th through it so you guys don't fall asleep. So, the, you know, the prevalence is, is high, 27% uh, of the adults in the United States have some sort of uh, venous abnormality, and 70 to 90% of all the leg ulcers are caused by chronic venous insufficiency. And it costs a fortune to take care of these patients and make them well, which, by the way, that is just a short time lived. You know, the, the recurrence is, is high in, in some of these patients, mainly because compliance, and that's something we need to understand. Diagnosis, clinical. Uh, physical examination, first, you know, go back to the basics. Uh, there are some tests that you probably never heard of, you know, Trendelenburg-Perthes, you know, those tests were clinical tests to see if the superficial system was affected or the deep of the perforators. You probably, who has heard those, those terms in, in med school or, in, raise, raise your hand whoever knows about this test. None. That's what I'm saying, you know. It, it's clinical stuff. You don't have to do it. I'm just saying the, 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 the management and diagnosis of venous disease has evolved so much that now we have other stuff that is way more accurate and can help us, um, you know, diagnose and treat our patients. And also classify your patients is important, and we are talk we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, Non-invasive tests, venous duplex ultrasound and air plethysmography are the top uh, studies used to see what's going on in the venous system in the lower extremities. Invasive tests, obviously, they descend in veno uh, venography. And based on that and the clinical uh, uh, findings, you are going to classify your patients. That's key. Before you start treating a patient, you need to obviously do the physical examination, do the diagnosis, and classify. Why? Because you need to have some uh, frame uh, of reference to see what the progress is going to be. And that's key to uh, uh, treat these patients, but most importantly, to explain to them what is going to happen? Nobody cares about veins. Oh, the arteries bypasses. And, uh, no, 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 no. They think veins is just like, oh, I just did. No, it's complex and with recurrence and disappointment. And, you know, because all the marketing we have now, uh, they have misled the public and they need to be re educated by us, by people that really care. Uh, to deliver a good service. So how are you going to classify? Again, you probably see all this. The CAP classification is probably the most uh, versed in, in, um, in uh, complete classification we have. There are other ones. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the, what you're going to use the most is the C part, you know, with the clinical presentation, what you're going to see on these patients. But also has the, the ideology, what is you think the problem might be is congenital, primary, secondary, or you didn't, you have no clue what it is, which is <laughs> happens often. But we use fancy words like cryptogenic to make you feel like you know what you're talking about when really you have no idea what's going on with the patient, and that's what you need to tell them. Uh, where is the problem located? The superficial, perforator, deep system, and so forth. And what is the path of pathophysiology? Again. Disclosure, this is not my girlfriend or my wife, uh, you know. But this already Ruth went through that. But believe me, it's going to be in your board, so you start better managing this. There are going to be two questions about veins. It's probably one, okay? The, the, the zero, the, 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 the clinical uh, classification of uh, CAP. Number C1 is telangiectasia, so reticular veins, C2, 
frank varicose veins, C3 swelling, edema, C4 eczema or pigmentation, C5 lipodermatosclerosis. This is a tricky thing, lipodermatosclerosis, because we don't know what causes it. I'm going to take a minute just to address this because there is no, not many people talk about that. Has, uh, Eunice mentioned something about it, and, th and that's good, but we don't know what causes it, so therefore we don't know what to treat it how to treat it, and it goes up and down. Sometimes the patients have severe pain, almost like a reflex sympathetic dystrophy, almost. They can't tolerate any the sheets of the, of, of, of the bed, the water of the shower, and sometimes goes away. So this is very important to identify lipodermatosclerosis because the first question the ladies are gonna ask is, can we reverse this? The answer is no. The objective is to hold it, stop it, and hopefully don't get worse and have control of the symptoms. C5 is a healed ulcer and C6 oh, is an active venous ulcer. Uh, anatomy, again, I'm not gonna go over that, but just, you know, brushing over this. Uh, deep system, the important thing about this slide is the uh, iliac veins and the inferior vena cava. When people think about DVT in the lower extremity, I don't know, automatically we think from the common femoral vein down. Well. But these are very often forgotten. And in patients with recurrent uh, post-flavitic syndrome with chronic venous stasis ulcers that they don't heal despite all the treatments from the inguinal ligament down, you need to think automatically iliac, ilio, iliac, uh, um, iliac disease or possibly vena cava. Uh, now, the other way to classify this is the venous severity scoring system. This was created by the American Venus Forum in 2000, and it was it took bit, bits and pieces of different and other uh, uh, systems like a venous disability score, the venous segmental disease score, and so forth, uh, in order to make a comprehensive way to assess your patients, not only clinically but uh, but also quality of life, and with that, you know, assess better the plan of treatment and also keep a tag on the patient and see if he's improving or not, or she's improving. In 2008, they revise it. They change it. They expand more into some subjects. This, this, this ones that you are looking into the screen, you know, pain, varicose veins, uh, et cetera. I'm not going to read that. And uh, the, revi the revision basically was regarding pain, expand the description, what type of pain, what time of the day, uh, et cetera, Wh what segments of the leg might be the problem uh, with pain than, uh, more than others, size of the veins, uh, the swelling, you know, what time of the day presents after the patient stands, uh, how many minutes, hours, or whatever the, swell, the, the, the edema starts. So this is the picture of the Perthes, uh, the, yeah, no, 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 the uh, trendelenburg maneuver, maneuver, you know. It's just, just to, for you guys that nobody has seen it or, or you haven't seen it, uh, this is the idea, you know. The, you can see the greater saphenous vein right there with the varicose vein coming from the greater saphenous vein. They empty the leg, they put a tourniquet, and then let it go. And then that's to confirm that the saphenofemoral junction is, is, uh, is incompetent. This is just a note for... Uh, because I imagine no many people have heard of those tests, that they were very common in the 50s and, and 60s. Now, obviously, we have the venous duplex ultrasound. This is the key on that. Anybody that does a venous duplex ultrasound for reflux in both legs and takes 15 minutes, that's a piece of trash, okay? I wouldn't operate my dog with that ultrasound, okay? So it, it, it's very complex to do a good venous ultrasound, you need to trust, you good, you're waking up. You need to trust your tech because you're gonna base your decisions in whatever they are gonna show you. It's not just go here to 7-Eleven, they have now in Sam's maybe uh, ultrasounds going on, all that kind of stuff. No, you need to trust what you're gonna do. You know, you know why? Because they're gonna tell you the greatest afternoon vein is incompetent. Okay, that's it. And then you put the ultrasound to put the axis and the greater saphenous vein is one millimeter under the skin. You can ablate that vein. And you're already with the patient drape and everything. Who do you think is gonna look like an idiot? 
So you need to trust your tech and know exactly what you want to do with the ultrasound and what points you want to take in order to deliver the service. So in the deep system, the reflux should be a one second or longer. You need to know the morphology of the veins, uh, what I was just saying, and the anatomy. What is the location of these veins? And obviously, the sensitivity and specificity of the ultrasound is extremely high. That's what is a very is the first choice that we have in order to diagnose venous insufficiency, superficial or deep. The airplane tomography, as you know, is the same one for artery. You know, it's this device that is going, it's a cuff that is going to go around the limb and it's going to detect, it's going to be inflated and it's going to detect any change in volume in the leg in order, caused obviously by blood volume that is accumulated in the limb that is being tested and that is going to tell you uh, what the pressure is and is and volumes and so forth has different steps. Obviously, you need to you need to empty the leg, then you need to stand, uh, do a tiptoe, and then relax again, and then do a series of tiptoes, and then uh, measure the uh, values that the volume, uh, the blood volume, is displaced of the air in the cough, and then calculate that. Uh, all these numbers you can read it and memorize it. I'm not going to go over each one of them. You need to know that they exist, and then learn them. Why? Because maybe an old attending in the, your institution might ask you and, 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 and try to get an information. This is not used as often as it used to be before. You know, or now ultrasound is dominating the field. Descending venogram, obviously this is from a book. Uh, I'm not gonna claim any, uh, any ownership, obviously. You see in the first one is normal, all the valves are competent, you can see the the valves holding the reflux of the contrast. In the second one is deep venous insufficiency. You can see, um, do we have a, yeah. You can see, oh, great. So you can see the deep venous, uh, the valve in the, in the femoral vein leaking some contrast, and in the last one is superficial. I mean, it's just basic anatomy. That, the obvious disadvantage is that it's invasive. You need to go in, in the hospital and do that. This is just a, uh, who know who was uh, Fabrizio? It's not the guy on the, with the long hair in the women's nose. Who knows? Who knows? Nobody? Okay. Fabrizio da Quapendente was an Italian anatomist and was the first one to describe the valves inside the veins. And uh, this is a normal valve. Obviously, it's not blood, it's water. But it's how they're supposed to work, you know, containing the blood. This is an abnormal valve, valve after thrombosis. It's not doing anything. You can see still some residual thrombus there. That's for you to have a picture of what is going on inside those. So the next step in the di in diagnosis, well, veno venography versus intra intra intravenous ultrasound, intravascular ultrasound. Venogram is, you know, the test for excellence that we're doing for, to assess the deep venous uh, um, system in a more invasive ways to try to pinpoint exactly where the obstruction or the uh, stenosis or the reflux is. Uh, this, obviously, the, is done in the hospital and, and, and requires the patient to go uh, be admitted either uh, as an outpatient or overnight, but requires that kind of uh, activity. So the intravascular ultrasound, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. You, know, you need to insert a larger sheath into the vein, about nine French, in order to put intravascular ultrasound and have a better assessment over the blood vessels that you are looking at. So you have all sorts of numbers and comparisons. There is no question the intravascular ultrasound is more uh, accurate in diagnosis stenosis, obstruction, or, uh, or even thrombosis in some of the blood vessels rather than venogram. It's been proven again and again. And the difference in cost and um, trouble for the patient is not that much because the patient, it, all these studies, these two studies needs to be done in the hospital. So you diagnose your patient with deep venous insufficiency. You can have post phlebitic syndrome. You can have uh, lymphedema, you can, whatever. So what are you going to do with the patient? That's the key, right? I mean, you diagnose, great. Now what are you going to do? So it's very important lifestyle change, and I take special time to tell my patients about this because everybody says, oh, well, you just need to lose weight. You just need to exercise. Now, we need to do this, which is going to pay my kids' college tuition. We need to do the ablation. No, you need to start 
explain the patient that if that lady or that gentleman is 350 pounds, that's not normal. It's not going to work. So it's important to start with uh, uh, lifestyle. Compression stockings are key, as Dr. Bush mentioned earlier. This is just a quick chart how I use the compression stockings. 8 to 16 is just anti-embolic, the tail hose they put you in the uh, hospital. Uh, but the treatment starts from 16 millimeters of mercury and higher. And, uh, and you can see there all the different. Um... Now, nobody's going to use more than 30 millimeters of mercury. Nobody. It's too hot. So whatever the book says, fine but nobody's gonna use it. So I'd rather give the patient something suboptimal and tell them it's suboptimal, but it's more chance that you're gonna use it that rather give you something that you are not gonna use. And this thing is blinking. I think they are gonna, I'm gonna combust here or something anyway. <laughs> so anyway, non-surgical, the una booth, you know. Uh, um, principles, you need to be, first do not harm. First, do not harm. That's important in venous disease, in any disease, but in these patients because they come hopeful with some idea that Dr. Oz has put them on their heads and they want you to, to re replicate that. Uh, choose the, 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 the appropriate level of intervention. Uh, <laughs> now, just give me a, these nice, nice pictures from books that, you know, just for you guys to know that they exist, but this is something that is clear. Three steps, what do I prefer to do in different levels? In the iliac, stenting, in the common femoral vein, and external iliac, maybe end of lebectomy, and transpos this is for venous insufficiency, for uh, transposition of valves in the lower, uh, in the distal segment. Post-thrombotic syndrome is a patient of mine, chronic DVT, doesn't take care of his leg, there it comes back. Anyway, so be careful. Be careful with these patients. Do not mess with the deep system if you don't have to. You need to have a good reason to do it because it's not forgiven. And if you must do it, let me go back here. If you must do it, uh, look for some experienced guys around. That's the key, especially if they are wearing kilts. But be careful. Don't get too close to them.